Bertoni and Chelsea Northrup with six rules for architectural photography. The first one is really simple and it's get it level. The easiest way is to look for horizontal lines in the photo and make sure that they are completely level. That's impossible for me to do naturally, but every modern camera allows you to turn a level on the rear screen. So hit the display button or info button until you see that horizontal line come up. And then every time you shoot, make sure that it's as level as possible. If you forget, or if you're less than perfect, shoot wider than you need to and give yourself room to crop in post because you can always level it in post, but you're gonna lose some of those precious megapixels. I'm gonna get to rule two real quick, but first I wanna thank our sponsor, KEH. KEH is where we start anytime we want the best value for gear, used gear, the biggest used selection in the world. Whether it's a tripod, a camera, a lens, or any other type of photographic gear, I started at this link right here. That brings you to KEH. And when you do find what you want, try our coupon code. You can get the most up-to-date code in the description and that'll make sure you get as much as 5% off. Thanks for sponsoring us, KEH. Not only do you want your lines to be level horizontally, but vertically you also want them to be straight and parallel. And that can be difficult because oftentimes with architecture photography, you're using a wide angle lens and the wider it gets, it can often distort all of the lines in your photo. There are a few different ways to deal with this. A lot of pros use a tilt shift lens, but those can run you thousands of dollars. So if you can't afford to do it while you're shooting your shot, you can do it in post. You can use perspective correction to straighten the lines and make sure Sure that your building's not tilting forward or back and looks perfectly vertical and straight. In Lightroom Classic, the transform panel here can often solve your problems. You can press auto and sometimes that fixes it automatically. If it doesn't, you can go to guided. And with guided, you specify some lines in the picture that should be horizontal and vertical. We'll use this line as a horizontal line and then we can use this as a vertical and add more lines as necessary. And now the subject is perfectly square, but at the same time, because we're accustomed to seeing some amount of perspective distortion, it might look a little top heavy. If you don't know that much about editing, well, good news, we've written like 30 something books, but one of them is a Lightroom book. So if you'd like to learn how to do these things in Lightroom, you can check out our book. We also have some more videos, so don't forget to like and subscribe. So I'm at like 70 millimeters now, as far back as I can physically go to show you the difference between 16 up close and 70 far away. Looking side by side at photos taken at 16 millimeters and 83 millimeters, you can see at 16 millimeters, everything looks a little bit skewed. Even though this is perfectly level, the tops of the doors are smaller than the bottoms of the doors, just because of Chelsea's perspective. But at 83 millimeters, everything looks perfectly square. In architectural photography, you strive for correctness, for accuracy, and you can see the telephoto lens provides a more accurate and true result. So if you're shooting telephoto and zooming in, you're going to get less of the distortion. But one thing to consider is you're also going to get less depth because as you shoot telephoto, you're flattening everything into one plane and having depth in a photo is often what makes it beautiful. So you have to balance those two things. Another issue with shooting very telephoto is that you will introduce more distractions between you and your subject because there's more distance between you and your subject. So you could have more people walking through or more trees or like here, there's a car, but I was able to frame it out. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your lenses. I recommend bringing a wide range of lenses. I photographed the arch at 24 millimeters and 57 millimeters. At 24 millimeters, notice that the arch seems to be leaning back a little bit. Whereas at 57 millimeters, it looks much more square. At 24 millimeters, we can see there's a little bit of curving apparent at the top and in these horizontal lines. Whereas at 57 millimeters, it appears completely square. At 24 millimeters, we see much more of the background, these entire buildings, whereas at 57 millimeters, everything is compressed much more. However, I'm closer at 24 millimeters, and that means I have fewer distractions. There are fewer things between me and the subject, 
Whereas in this crowded park at 57 millimeters, the number of NYU graduates increases drastically, making it harder to even see the subject. We're talking about lots of gear, wide, medium, tight lenses. Whenever you're shopping for gear, go to this link to take you to KEH, the world's largest used camera gear store, where you can get the best prices on everything with a warranty, with a return period. That means there's no risk. And if you have old gear to sell or if you're upgrading, they'll give you the best possible price on that too. Thanks for sponsoring us, KEH. Be sure to use our link and the coupon code that's in the description is always going to be the latest one. Thanks. Our third point and tip and the most important one is to choose your light wisely. And today we chose a great example of what not to do. If you look at these buildings behind me, there's an incredible amount of depth. They're layered on top of one another with different shapes and colors, and yet it's flat. And that's because the light's flat. It's an overcast day. All of the light is diffused. There's no hard shadows. So when you choose your light, you want to choose your sun in the position where it's going to create the shadows that you want, which can become a part of your composition, the shadows that you want on the buildings so that you're having a lot of depth and a lot of contrast. And there are apps for that. So you can figure out where the sun is in relation to your subject. And also you can just practice if you're not doing a job where you only have one moment to capture your subject. My favorite app for planning is called Photo Pills, but there's a lot of apps. You can use the two dimensional planner here to zero in on a specific location. You don't have to be standing there and see exactly where the sun or even the moon is going to be at a given time. So I can pan through different times of day and different times of year to determine when the sun is gonna be over here and lighting this up, which it's not doing now. There's also an augmented reality mode, what they call AR. And the AR mode here overlays the position of the sun at different times of day. So if you're on location, then you can pan around and see where the sun is gonna be. So right now the sun is there creating a shadow on this wall, but I know if I am here at 9 a.m., I should have sunlight. Between nine and 10, there should be a time when the sun peeks out behind that building and lights this up. So if I need to illuminate this, I'll come back at a different time of day. Note that if you're in a place with really narrow streets, like old European cities, the only time you might be able to get anything lit up is when the sun is directly overhead. Just something to plan around. Rule number four is to eliminate distractions and that can be hard in a place like New York City. So you might need to get up extra early. Another technique is to take a lot of pictures and then you can stack them together and composite out the people or cars that are ruining things. Generative fill and Photoshop is also super useful for eliminating things and just creating a, a scene that might not be there but is more pure. Rule number five is actually to include at least one distraction to add a little bit of scale. If you have a person or a car in front of a building, especially a grand building, it'll help show you just how big that is and make the picture a little more meaningful. I'll also use a neutral density filter and a tripod to do a long exposure. That way any people in the frame, if they're moving, they'll appear a little bit blurry and that makes them a little bit less distracting. So you can reduce distractions without necessarily completely eliminating them. These two photos of the arch were taken at the same spot, but this photo was shot at 1 50th of a second while this was shot at eight seconds. This is really worst case scenario in that we had people holding very still and posing for photos, but you can still see, even in the worst case scenario, the people are much less distracting in the eight second shot than they are at the 1 50th shot. Here with the people still, your eye immediately focuses on their faces and you don't even see the arch. But with this movement, you'd spend more time taking in the surroundings, including the architecture, which was meant to be the focus of this photo. Rule number six is to be conscientious about the height of your camera. By default, we all kind of hold the camera up to our eye, but you can get different effects by going higher or lower. So this building behind me has a very interesting entryway, but I don't want my entire picture to be filled up with ground. So if I shoot this from eye level, almost the entire bottom third of the picture is just the boring pavement here. But if I get closer to the ground, 
that takes up a much smaller portion of the picture because I'm low to the ground and tilting up a little bit. However, by shooting low and tilting up with a wide angle lens, things become a little bit more distorted. So that means I'll have a little bit more correction to do in post-processing. Even though both these photos were taken at 16 millimeters, the lower angle increases the amount of perspective distortion that we see because by being lower, that brings the bottom of the door closer to me and the top further away. So things appear squarer when the camera is about mid height for any columns or vertical elements. However, being lower also added additional depth to the photo by making the perspective of the ground here much more interesting. There's not a single right answer when choosing the height of your photo, but these are factors to consider. That's just the beginning of what you need to learn about architecture, photography. You can go very in depth. And a lot of what we learned today was from Stephen Brook, who does this full time. He's a magnificent teacher and he also has an entire YouTube channel on it. So I recommend checking him out. And of course, thank you for watching and thank you KEH for making this video possible and for making buying used gear easy and worry-free. So be sure to check out KEH and use our links and our codes in the description below make sure that we get some credit and you get a good deal. Thanks. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you want more tutorials, check out our award-winning book, Stunning Digital Photography, which includes more than 20 hours of free video. Bye.